Black is an extra pawn here. I have three versus two. No chances for white to win. Now, in this position, I did offer Lev a draw here. Um, so I offered Levon a draw here, and he thought for probably about a minute and a half, and he declined it. I assume he just, he literally didn't care about seven, rate, seven rapid rating points, um, and so he chose to play on. So to set the stage, we drew both for our classical games, and today we had our tiebreakers. Now the rapid portion was 15 minutes, 15 minutes plus 10 second increment for move one, which was a little bit surprising. Uh, it's definitely a quicker form of rapid versus the traditional, which is 25 minutes plus 10 seconds. Um, but at any rate, I felt very good about my chances. So I start out with e4 once again. Levon plays e5, knight f3, and now he plays knight c6. Now again. I play bishop b5 and Levon plays a6 again rejecting to play the Berlin defense um I mean I guess Levon felt that he, he felt that it just wasn't the right time or place he plays a6 I go bishop a4 knight to f6 and now I castle bishop e7 rook to e1 is what I play here and after rook to e1 now he plays pawn to b5 bishop b3 castles and again I play h3 here so the reason that I the reason that I play H3 here is very simple. I had prepped it before. I felt confident. I thought I had some improvements on my previous game against Levon, and so I was more than willing to play it. Additionally, after a very long event with so many games, I obviously had done a lot of preparation. I looked at so many different openings. It didn't feel like the right time to try and reinvent the wheel, especially in rapid chess, where generally you just want to be fresh and try to just play good, quick moves. So Bishop B7, I play D3, and now Levon returns his main line with pawn to D5 sort of playing a gambit anyway so i take he takes and now i play this move a4 knight takes e5 i believe is not a great move here because i think after knight takes rook takes knight f6 there's bishop d6 and there are, there are definitely some play on the diagonals i don't know if it's uh completely sound but in general i know that uh black does well in practice so instead i choose to play the move pawn to a4 levon plays knight d4 and now i play knight bd2 now one thing that also is important to note is generally when you can play play your opponent's openings against them, sometimes they feel a little bit uncomfortable. Those of you guys who are watching the Speed Chess Championship being featured on chess.com, I believe it was in the quarterfinals, Ding uh, Ding Loren played with the black piece against Levon Aronian, and Levon actually played this exact setup with A4 Knight BD2 against Ding with white. So I figured that Levon probably, if he, if he was willing to play with the white pieces, he probably liked it, and therefore it would be a nice try to um, just make him play the same position on the other side. So I play knight bd2, he takes, I take back, and now I goes knight b4. Now there are many different options here. Ding played pawn to f6, I believe knight b4 is a move, I think, I don't know if c5 is a move as well, but there are, there are a couple different moves here for black. At any rate, knight b4 is played, now I take the pawn at e5, of course I have to grab, black has two bishops, so I have to show something for it, so I take the pawn, queen d5, and now I play pawn to f3 here, Levon plays bishop d6, and I play d4. Now again, I had looked at this on the rest day, um, for my upcoming match with Levon, so I was still very much in preparation. And this is where Levon plays a strange move. He plays this move, Rook AE8. Now, this is a mistake. Um, in this position, the, the best move, I believe, is Rook AD8, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but instead, Levon plays Rook AE8. Now, you can say that, like, oh, you know, you did this prep, it's, it's you know, that, that's why you got this big advantage. But preparation does matter. And um, for someone like Levon, who obviously spent a lot more time preparing the openings than I have, to make a blunder like this, it does show you guys just how hard it is to remember all these different lines that are going through your head during the course of a game. So he plays rook a8. I play a takes a takes b5 here, obviously very, very logical move. He takes back, and now I go bishop to d2. Now again, white is up a pawn here, um, but black has two bishops, and in a lot of these martial lines, generally the bishop pair is more than enough compensation for the extra pawn. So now knight to c6 is played here by Levon, and now I go bishop to f4. Very important move here, trying to keep the knight in the center of the board. I could take, but after bishop takes, for example, this bishop on d6 is really nasty. It's eyeing these, these, uh, these holes on g3 and h2. Again, black should be completely fine here, if maybe not even better. So instead I go bishop f4 here, and the idea is quite simple. If black tries to take on e5, I'll take back, and black can't recapture because then after the queen trade, I just win the bishop on e5. And if black additionally tries something like f6 here, I can now go knight takes knight, and black cannot capture the bishop and get the, the bishop pair because I had knight e7 with the fork, and after rook takes e7, rook e7, white is just winning. 
So the whole point behind this move is that if I take, black gets the two bishops and black is doing great. But by interposing, I guard the knight, but I also threaten to trade off knights and bishops. If I can get some position, like let me make a random move, something like this, for example, white is much better if not winning because now it's just a lone bishop. It's not a bishop pair. So if I can trade off a set of knights and bishops, then the extra pawn will play. So the Vaughn goes king h8. Now I play bishop h2. Maybe not the best move in retrospect. I know that um, uh, when I was when I looked at this in between in between games with my trainer Chris Littlejohn at the coffee shop next door, uh, the computer apparently like apparently like queen d2 more. But after bishop b4, c3 takes takes. I thought that, that after knight takes bishop takes f6, bishop c7, something like bishop d5. Computer gives it as plus two, but I felt that black's getting a big blockade on the light squares, and I'm not actually convinced that this is winning for white. Um, so that's why I didn't actually play this. In, in, in retrospect, maybe I should have, but I like this idea of bishop h2, because black has to trade, he takes back, and this leads to a forced end game. Uh, if I take the queen here, black does not recapture because I win the bishop, but black can actually take on h2 first, and then after bishop d5, he should be okay. So instead I take on e5, he takes back, we trade the rooks, and now I go queen d4. Now material has e has evened out here, but black has some problems. First of all, I have rook a7 to attack the bishop and the pawn. Secondly, I can pop the knight to c5 as well. So there are some positional weaknesses despite the fact that black has regained the lost material. So now here he plays queen g5, and now I go queen c5. Important move forcing an endgame. Again, if black can say... Get, keep keep peace on the board something like this and i can't trade queens black is actually doing just fine you have rookie two a lot of pressure potential on the diagonal so i have to simplify immediately so now i go queen to c5 forcing the trade of the queens of course he could play queen d8 but i can just take the pawn or maybe even go rook a7 here and it should be very good so he trades he goes bishop d5 rook a7 c6 and now i play knight to d3 now it's in this position that Levon starts to go wrong. I already think the position here was very, very critical um, for Levon. I think the best move to play was rook c8. I wasn't actually sure how I'm supposed to convert this if he plays rook c8 because my idea of knight before is nowhere near as effective because he just drops the bishop back and he pushes c5. Um, now this is pretty advanced, obviously, so most people won't pick up on this. But the reason I played knight d3 first was I thought if I go rook c7 here, he takes the a file and he's like rook a2, rook a1. Um, and I thought after knight d3, the rook is perfectly placed. I control the a file, I hit the pawn on f7, and I can always go rook c7 later. So that's the reason I played knight d3 first. Um, also, the knight on c5 is beautiful, but it doesn't attack anything. It's like it's on the dark square, but the bishop and the pawns are all holding, it, holding each other very nicely. Um, and knight d7 is also a move. Again, this was rapid, so you know don't, didn't have all the time in the world to think. But after rook d8, I didn't really see why this was great. I mean, if I follow the computer line, it says rook c7 g6 knight e5 and like king g7 and i guess after takes we reach some end game very similar to what happens in the game that's probably very good uh but i was i wasn't sure and again at this point i think i was still down about 30 seconds to a minute and i felt that it's easier for me to just play this position than it is for levon so try to look for natural natural moves and not spend too much time trying to find a perfect line so i played knight d3 plays g6 as i said rook c8 i think was the last real try uh, it goes g6 and now i go rook c7 and the point is very simple i want to go knight before and attack the bishop and attack the pawn here so he goes rook a8 play knight before attacking the bishop attacking the pawn goes king g7 rook a1 doesn't do anything here because after king f2 let's say it goes rook b1 i just go pawn to b3 and i very quietly wait if rook b2 i can even just run my king straight up the board and this should be winning so after king g7 i take the pawn on c6 and Levon trades, and we reach an endgame after rook d8. Now, I was actually very surprised to see this because this has shades of another game I played against Andre Yesipenko. Now, one thing you guys would remember in that game was it was very similar, except it was an A pawn, not a B pawn, so it's a little bit different. But there was a situation where Yesipenko could have had, um, let me make some random, mo random moves, where he could have had pawns on, I believe it was B4 and A5 with a rook on B6 versus a pawn on A6. And so there are some shades of, the, of that game in this um in this end game now here i chose to play this move g4 now the reason that i played g4 is obviously i didn't have all the time in the world to calculate but i actually felt that if black goes b4 and i get b3 with rook c4 this is what i want i thought i wanted the pawn closer now as it turns out what i should have done is gone b4 and c3 right away to lock the pawn on b5 because the pawn on b4 is actually better placed than it is on b5 but again we're we we're already getting a little bit low on time i didn't want to spend all the time in the world thinking because i knew there would be critical moments later so I play g4, he goes rook d2, 
And now I play H4. Now, again, I should have played B4, locked the pawn on B5, gone rook C5 and C3. Easier said than done, because I, as I said before, in my mind, I thought that if he goes B4, B3, this is actually better, because what happens is he plays H5 when we trade and I go rook C4. Now the rook is, is holding the pawn on H4 and targeting the pawn on B4. And I thought this was winning because say he goes king g6, king f1, let's just say king f5, king e1, rook h2, king d1, king guards the pawn on c2, rook guards h4, and now I just win the pawn on b4, and I assume I'm winning here. So in my mind, I thought that I wanted the pawn on b4 versus the pawn on b5. As it turns out, after b4, b3, if black just plays a move like h6 and just waits here, this probably is still technically a draw with correct play. So here h5 is played, I trade. And h5, by the way, I think is still okay. And now I play b4, which is a huge mistake. And I was very mad at myself for playing this uh, because I just miscalculated when I played this move. Now I thought this has to be winning because I just go rook c5. So if rook d4, c3, I saw what happens in the game, rook h4, rook c5. I thought, okay, I'm just winning the game. I'm winning the pawn, I'm b5, two connected. Good night, game over, all's well that ends well. But much to my horror, Levon spent, I think about four minutes here, maybe a little bit less, till he was down to 30 seconds, um, calculating this this line because it's very committal. If it's if it if it if it doesn't work that this line with king g6, if I get these two pawns and they're running, it's GG on the spot. So I think Levon objectively used too much time, and I think this is the reason he lost the game um, at this point in time is that he used about four minutes of his last four and a half minutes here to go rook d4, c3 takes. And now I play king g2. I wanted to play rook c5, this is my initial idea. Problem is after king g6 here, if I take the pawn, this is actually a draw. Rook c4, rook c5, we trade king f6, king g2, king e5, king g3, king d5, king h4, king c5, king h5, king c4, king g5, king c3, king f6, king d4. If takes, just king e3, and we reach a king versus king endgame. So I was very horrified when I realized, realized this during the game. So I played king g2. Now in retrospect, I think maybe king f2 would have been a little bit trickier, but I went to g2. Goes to rook f4. I play king g3. Again, black cannot play rook c4 here because after trade, I have a protected pass pawn and now I can just use my king and gobble the pawns on the king side. So Levon plays rook f5 here. Now I go pawn to f4. Again, the idea is just simply, I, I think, just, just try and get this pawn further up the board. Maybe still trade. Like, if I if I reach the right moment where this pawn is far enough up the board, maybe there's some chance that I can win this endgame. Now, mind you, this is still a draw, because king c4 takes, takes. f5, b4, f6, b3. King g7, b2, f7. And we both queen, and it's a draw. But Levon here plays h4. Now, this is... It's still probably a drawn end game, but when Levon played H4, I was actually quite happy uh, because now, now it's very simple. Levon has to prove that he can draw this while I have one idea, rook c5 and gobble the pawn. So he goes rook f3, I play king g4, rook d3, and now I go rook c5. Important, by the way, I don't go king, king f4 because then I have to rook d5. Black's just guarding the pawn forever and none of these trades ever work, especially with an outside f pawn. So here I go rook c5, lock the lock the rook on c5 where everything guards each other. And now my idea is very simple. Much like in that Yesipenko line that I mentioned before from my game against him, idea is just run the king over and gobble on b5. So we have king f6, king f4, king e6, king e4, rook d8, and now I just take. Now again, you can try rook h3 here, and after king d4, apparently this is still a draw because you can go check, king d3, check, king c2, check king b3 and now you play f5 and after rook b5 f4 you'll notice that the pawn is very fast my king is very far away the king is not anywhere near the f pawn so this should be a draw with perfect play now again very hard to fault levon obviously because it's i mean you're he was very long time he had like 10 seconds maybe and um any blunders with rook d8 so now i take rook d1 and now i check the king back and now i go rook f6 idea is to attack the pawn on f7 and eventually i want to run these two pawns up the board King e7 is played, I go rook f3. Idea behind rook f3 is that now with the two connected pawns, I can always exchange the rooks if he takes and goes here. I just go here. King can never capture the backwards pawn because then the pawn just rolls up the board. And meanwhile, my king goes and eats the pawn and the king can never capture either of these pawns on c3 or b4. So Levon plays f5, I go king d4, rook b1, and now I go rook e3, king f6, rook e8. Basically, again, the idea is very simple. I just need to start pushing the pawns up the board. So he plays f4, I go rook b8. Now, I don't know if this is the best move. I, I felt like this was winning here, but I couldn't quite calculate it. And again, with very little time left on the clock, I wasn't certain. But I think the way to win is check, and then king c5, king g4. And I think I go c4, f3, and b5 here. And after king g3, 
I think King B6 is winning, but I wasn't sure during the game. F2, C5. Now, of course, you see the eval bar says it's winning, and I guess after rook C1, C7, King F4, King B7, black loses by one tempo because I can queen, King D6, B6, King 6, B7. And this is, this is winning for white, but again, with very little time on the clock, it's a little bit hard to judge. So instead, I play rook to B8, a very similar idea, just try to push the pawns of the board with the rook guarding. So he goes King F5, B5, F3 here. And now here again, I make a mistake. I play King E3. Now, what I should have played here was Rook F8, King G4, and just gone all in with this idea. Um, although actually all in with this idea is the wrong way of putting it, because apparently the only winning move here is King E4. Um, and I'm not confident that I would have found this move with 30 seconds on the clock, um, but apparently this is winning. Instead, I play King E3. Now here, Levon plays Rook B3. I go King D3, and now Levon makes makes a big blunder, which is he goes King G4. The way to draw this game here was to play King E5, and after King to C4, he can just go Rook to B1, Rook to F8, and now after King E4, he's going to be in time because my pawns are not far enough up the board. Like King C5, King E3, C4, F2. Let's say I go King B6, he makes a queen, takes, takes, C5, King D4, C6, uh, King D5, C7, Rook C1. King b7, king d6, and now if I make a queen, takes and king c5 is a draw. And if I go b6 actually after king d7, I think I lose, I guess it's still a draw, but there's no reason to allow this. So if black plays king e5 here, it's a draw, but instead Levon goes king g4, and I think when he went king g4, he missed my next move, which was king c2. And now after king c2, Levon um, play blunders again with f2. Only try here is to play rook a3, but it feels very random because now after rook f8, now you see a clear path to get the pawns rolling off the board, and it's hard to believe that black isn't losing this. Mind you, it's still apparently a draw with correct play, but it feels, it, it just, it's tricky to play. So here was his time running down, and, and Lev, I think, had maybe 10 seconds. If that, he plays f2, and now after rook f8, the game is basically over because now black has to take, and after rook takes pawn, Levon actually ran out of time here. He, he flagged on the clock, but he would have lost anyway since it's a classic end game. King is super cut off here. The only way to try and save it is rook b8. But after c4, rook c8, king c3. Let's say king g5 here. I can go king d4. He checks me. I go king e5 here. If he, if he checks, I just go d6, check king c7, c5, c6. Classic Lu Lucena position. Um, those of you guys who were around in the 1600s, remember that classic uh, classic knowledge. Uh, those of you who weren't, you can obviously watch some of my other videos. I think I went over this with Bjergsen, for example. At any rate, um, this is just winning because I can just run the king up the board. And there's really nothing else that needs to be said about this. So uh, Lev did flag here after I captured on F2, but he would have lost the game. Anyway, the one other point to make is that Rook F5 doesn't work. It's the, it's the one other idea that does exist in some positions, to try and get the king over to cut the file off. But after takes in King B3, King E5, King B4, this is also just a theoretically winning king upon endgame. So I did win this game. Um, and with that, I took a 1-0 lead in the tiebreak match. So obviously I was feeling very, very good about myself. We had a 15 minute break before coming back for the second game. Again, knowing that even if I lost this game, I would have a blitz tiebreaker definitely put me much more at ease. And I figured it's on Levon to prove something. So here Levon plays E4 again, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop C4. And now I play Bishop C5 again, going right back into the opening of the South, also known as the Italian, Castles, Knight F6. And here Lev played Rook E1. Now, this is a very unusual move order. What I probably should have done here was played knight g4. But I just figured, okay, what's what's the big difference? Just stay stay true to the nature of the position and just play d6. But there's actually a reason this isn't right. Because now white can go c3 and play pawn to d4 and take the center right away in one go with an extra tempo on the bishop. So now here I play bishop to a7. He plays h3, stopping bishop g4. I go castles. And now he goes bishop e3. Now, in most Italians, you'll notice the white pawn starts on d3 here. And generally, you, you don't want to waste two moves on, on d3 and then d4 as well. It just it's not, it's not what you're aiming for. Um, but here, white gets it in one go. So already after bishop e3, Lev is doing very well. There's no knight g4 to hit the bishop or bishop g4. And white has d4 being played. So as I said before, at the very beginning... When white is able, to, white or black, you get the d4, f4 break or d5, f5. Whoever gets it, if they're able to consolidate the center, generally it's better for them. And white is better here. So I play h6, logical move to stop bishop g5, just creating some latanza for my king on h7 as well. We got bishop b3, rook e8, knight bd2. Now it's worth noting that I cannot actually take the pawn here on e4 because after white goes d5, if I take the bishop on e3, rook e3, both knights are under attack. 
And if I move my knight, he swaps the bishops and takes the knight on e4. So I can't really grab the pawn on e4 here. So I play rook e8, knight d2. Again, if I take on d4, I'm not sure what the best way for white to play is, but at the very least, I saw knight takes pawn, knight e4 trade, and this nasty bishop f7 check. If I take, there's queen f3 to capture the rook on e4. So I knew that I couldn't really trade in the center right away, so I start developing. Bishop d7, queen b1, queen e7, and now Lev plays a3. Again, shades of shades of our Spanish games where, again, Lev wants the bishop on the diagonal, so he plays a3 to create the square for the bishop on a2. So now I play queen to f8, queen to d3, logical move to guard over guard this pawn on d4, and also the queen of the knight guard the pawn on e4 as well. So now I play b5. Rook a c1 is played, and now I go knight a5. Now, I think rook a c1 was really the big mistake at this point in the game. Lev, I think, was up about three to four minutes on the clock. And I think if he had gone bishop c2 or bishop a2 here, I would have been hard-pressed to come up with a clear-cut plan. Because, again, I don't really want to take on d4. I don't have a pawn break in the center. White's also going to go something like b4 and a4, or even b4 and c4. And black is very cramped here. As I said before, let's just say I go rook, not rook b8, sorry, but like something like rook e7, b4. I don't have pawn breaks. I don't have ways to trade minor pieces. It's just a very, very unpleasant position to play. And I also was down, as I said, about four minutes on the clock at this point. Instead, Lev plays rook a c1, which I think is a big mistake, because now I get knight to a5, bishop a2, and now I'm able to get c5 and contest the center here. Again, if white trades, my knight guards the bishop, so it should be fine. Additionally, after I play c5, now this bishop on a2 is kind of crummy. Let's say white goes d5, c4. Let's just say queen f1. We trade some bishops here, for example. You'll notice that in this position, this light square bishop is just awful. It's staring at a pawn chain. And even if you get like a bishop on b1, it's still staring at pawns in the way here too. So after Lev makes this blunder and allows me to get c5, this should be, I think, completely fine for black. So here Lev plays b3. I go knight to c6, plays d5. Again, you don't really want to trade here because now your bishop on a2 looks really silly with the pawn in front of it. I can go rook d8, take the open file. Everything is great for black here. So he plays d5, knight e7, c4, and now I go knight g6. Again, trying to put the knight on f4, maybe long term. Lev goes b4. Again, I think at this point, Lev is already feeling like he didn't have much of an edge. He has to try to force it a little bit. So he plays b4. So now I take on b4. He takes. I take on c4. He takes back. And now I trade on e3. Go rook b8. Queen a3 and queen d8. Very logical moves here, of course, trying to bring everything over the queen side. He has one weakness. Actually, we both have weaknesses. a6 is a weakness and b4 is a weakness. So if I can win this b4 pawn for the a6 pawn, I should have no problems because all because the pawn structure on the king side is completely fine for both sides here. Um, so I play queen d8 and Lev plays bishop f1. And this is where I made a very serious mistake. I'm very lucky that it did not cost me the game because when I played queen d8, I actually calculated this line with bishop f1. And in my mind, I was going to go a5 here. And the point is after pawn takes, rook takes. If white takes on d6, I go knight e8 and the queen is actually trapped here. There are no squares. You'll notice the rooks cover every single square. So this queen is trapped here. And if white has to trade the b for the a pawn and go something like queen d3, now it's a now the position is completely symmetrical and I should never lose this position in a million years. So I actually calculated this, or I don't even know if it was bishop f1 or some other move, but I saw this idea with a5. And then when he went bishop f1, I immediately played bishop b5. And as soon as I played this move, I realized that this was a huge mistake and I was not happy with myself at all. Because if I played a5, I think the game would have ended in a draw relatively soon and I would have had no issues whatsoever. Instead, I played bishop b5, and now Lev plays queen a5, which I actually thought was a great move. When I played bishop b5, I was thinking to myself, okay, I'm still going to get a5 in, right? Because the only ways for white to stop it are queen a5 or knight b3. And when he was thinking, I was like, okay, well, if he goes knight b3, I can even just trade and maybe go queen b6. That should be fine. Um, but I was also, but then I also realized he does have queen a5. And while he was thinking, I was like, I'm really hoping, I was really hoping he would not play queen a5. But in fact, he does go queen a5. So now I trade the bishops, he trades queens, and the problem here is that now I can't actually get rid of my weak a6 pawn for the pawn on b4. If I go a5, he goes b5, and after rook b8, rook b1, this is very scary. There's knight c4 attacking everything, basically, e5, d6, and a5, and this is a pass pawn on b5 rolling up the board. So the problem here is that I can't exchange these two pawns. If I could get this position with a5 trade, easy draw, no issues whatsoever, but I can't really get that now. So I play rook b8, he goes rook b3 to guard the pawn. Knight guards the rook very importantly, so if I play a5, he can just take, because if I trade, I'm just down a pawn. Although wait, oh no, sorry, if I go, oh no, I had a5. Oh no. 
As you guys see, I'm doing my analysis based off of what I recall during the game. That's actually... That's actually stupid. I just forgot during the game that I can take the pawn at e4, and this is actually completely fine for black. Okay, so I, I missed that. Oh, that's very poor, very poor. So instead I played rook b5. Same idea here to go a5 um, and try to trade off the pawns. So he plays knight e1. Now I go knight e8, knight e3, and now I played f5. Now, after the game, Love felt that he probably should have taken the pawn on f5. Again, after knight e7, g4, knight takes d5, black should be fine, but the game goes on at least for white. Instead, Love plays f3. I trade the pawns on e4, and now I go knight f4. Again, important move here. I have a lot less space and I have some weaknesses, but if I can trade off a couple of pieces, the, the chances of making a draw go up um, infinite, go, go up by a lot. So I play knight f4. He tra trades on f4, I take back, and now he goes king e2, and now I go rook b8, rook b1, and knight f6. Now again, material is even here, but it's really important to note that if white is ever able to win the d6 pawn, he's going to have two connected in the center, and he will win this game. It's also worth noting at the same time, however, if I can put enough pressure on e4, then e4 and d5 are permanently weak, and I should be able to draw. So here he plays king to f3. Now I go pawn to g5, guarding the pawn, creating the chain, and now he plays knight c4. Now, I actually thought during the game he should probably play king d3 and try to bring the king closer to the center. And after knight d7, I was a little bit scared about knight c4 here. And I thought this was the initial idea because I, I saw knight c5, but oddly enough, this loses because he can take, sack the rook, and go king c2. And now he gets a c pawn rolling up the board, and knight d6 is coming in. And this is actually just completely lost. Because let's say rook b8, knight d6, three connected, he's going to get a connect three and win the game very quickly. So I was actually very surprised to see king f3 because king d3 did have me quite concerned. And I did think after knight d7, knight c4, I could maybe check and draw this. But I was very unsure whether this was truly a draw with a pass d pawn and something like rook a1 lurking in the wings. Um, but the computer says it's zero, so evidently this would have been the right try. Instead, Levon goes king f3. Now I play g5, knight c4, and now I go knight e8 to guard the pawn. Very important that even though he's an active knight versus a passive knight, his rooks are passive. They're tied down to his pawn on b4. So even though my knight is passive, his rooks are super passive. So it shouldn't really be all that bad. So here, Lev goes h4. I go rook c8, attacking the knight, and now he goes knight a5. Already, I think after h4, the whole advantage is gone. Because after knight f6, now his knight is on the wing, and I'm going to go rook e8. And there are, there's a lot of pressure here on the pawns on e4 and d5. And after knight f6, I felt pretty confident already that I would draw the game because of what happens. So he goes g, h takes g5, h takes g5, knight c6. Again, he can maybe try rook e1, but after rook e8, so much pressure here. If you play like knight c6, I just take and take the rook. No chances to lose. Um, if you go like rook bb1, again, it just feels like sooner or later after like king f7, king g6, and g4, black should be fine. So here, Lev plays knight c6, which is the final sort of blunder. After this move, there are zero chances of winning the game. So I play rook e8 here, attacking the pawn. As I alluded to before, if rook e1, I can just eat the pawn on d5. Thank you to CW55, CW for the 10 gifted subs. Thank you so much for the 10 gifted, appreciate it. Um, so in this position, if rook e1, I just take the pawn, and of course, I can never lose. And Lev played knight e4 quickly. The idea is that if I move the rook, he is knight e6, and now he's this great outpost on e6, and he's winning. But as I said, when I, when I played knight f6 with the idea, or when I played was it rook c8 or knight f6, one of those two moves, I had already seen this position in my analysis with pawn takes and without, and um, and I and I and I had spotted that after knight d4, I have the very little little uh, very nasty little trick, which is I just flick the pawn and create a check on g4. And the problem here is that if white goes back to f2, I just eat the pawn with check. If he goes to e2, I eat the pawn with check. And then actually after king d3, rook d5, everything is just gone here for white. So I have this little flick with g4, and after he takes the pawn, I just take on e4, and now everything is gone for white. King f5 is the only move. I take the knight, he takes my knight, I take on d5, and again, black is an extra pawn here. I have three versus two, no chances for white to win. Now in this position, I did offer Lev a draw here. Um, so I offered Levon a draw here and he thought for probably about a minute and a half and he declined it. I assume he just, he literally didn't care about seven rating, seven rapid rating points. Um, and so he chose to play on. So here he played Rook to F1. I go Rook H5 here. Again, the idea is very simple. The only chance for white to win here is if somehow you can get a mating trick like Rook C3. Actually, let me show you. So say I take with this Rook and he gets Rook C3. It feels a little bit dicey because say I play a move like Rook D3, he can actually checkmate with Rook C8, King H7, Rook H1, only move and then it's checkmate. 
So that's why here after king takes, I took with the rook because now I saw that with the connected towers on the fifth rank, I can always just check the king till infinity. So he goes rook f1 here. Again, if rook c3 here, at the very least, I think I can just check. King g6, I just check him. And if he goes this way, at the very least, I just check and go like rook e4, and there's no way I can ever lose. So instead, Lev plays rook to f1 to stop the check on f5. I go rook h5 here. And now he misses a beautiful concept. He plays this move rook f4, which loses the game. Now, it's worth noting in this position, Lev still could have gone king e6 and probably after check, maybe rook f6 is enough for a draw, maybe king d7 is chances. But at this point in time, with, the, with zero chances to win, you're kind of just making moves out of inertia. You're not really doing deep calculations because you know that the match is over. So Lev plays rook f4, which allows a beautiful checkmating pattern. So now I go rook h6 check, attacking the king. The rook is covering the fifth rank. King e7, only move. Now I check on b7. As you'll notice, the rook is covering all the squares on the sixth rank. King has to go to the back rank. And now I just do a classic ladder with rook h8, where the idea is to move the king with checkmate. So say white plays a move like rook e3. I go king g7 check, the seventh rank. King can't go back, so rook e8 is the only move. And now I play rook b8, and he can move the king, but he loses a rook. And the only other try is king c8. Now here it's important to not go rook a7. So I go to a7 after king c3, rook e7. White has rook c3, king g7, and rook c8 to block. So if white goes um, king c8, I actually play a very nasty move, which is rook to g7. And it's very simple. I'm just going to go king h7 and ladder checkmate the king on c8 next move. And white has no way to stop it, basically. you can. I guess you can... Um, maybe you can play like rook f8 to prolong the game. But if white had rook f3 here... And check in rook f8, white would still survive. But the problem is the pawn on g4 prevents it. So there's basically no solution to king h7 creating the ladder checkmate. And white's completely lost. So that's why in this position, um, in this position, after king d8, rook h8 here, Lev resigned the game. And with that, I win the match 2-0. And I do win the first leg of the FIDE Grand Prix here in Berlin. So very, very, I'm very, very happy to have, have won Won, won this match. Uh, obviously, today it felt much smoother because I got, I was really putting pressure on Lev in the first tiebreak game. Um, and throughout, it felt really, really good. So it seemed very, very smooth overall. Um, but still, it's it's always a bit surprising to win and definitely very, very happy about it. Apparently, somebody gifted 100 subs. Uh, if I missed it, I apologize. <laughs>